the front and back matter of your book is like a entry and a exit to your story. I find it to be very liminal and mysterious and steeped in tradition. Liminal is from the Latin meaning threshold or door, and the front and back matter really is a door in and out of your story. For example, Nora Jemison's book, we see that in her book, we have this beautiful frontispiece title page, this art on the title page, the epigraph and dedication, a map, and it carries on into the back matter. Likewise, things like inscriptions and signatures can be found in the front and back matter. Strange little Easter eggs and clues, like this book is dedicated to members of the cult. What does that mean? If you're like me and the reader experience is your priority, then you do want to craft a full experience in your front and back matter. In a previous video, I talked about formatting your book. So we used the Vellum software in that tutorial. And if you use Vellum, you can go to the little gear icon and from the list, select insert elements and the front matter and back matter will be listed there in the proper traditional order. Just insert all the elements and then fill them in. So it's easy as that. If you're using a professional book formatter, again, they will know all the nuances to the art of front and back matter. And it is really actually an art and it is quite complicated. There is a balance to it. There is a way to do it correctly. One exception to following the traditional format for front and back matter is for ebooks. The reason why is because in the look inside feature, which is the sample of your book, readers will only get to see 10% of your story. If you pack the front of your book full of endorsements and long acknowledgments and pictures of you and pictures of your dog, et cetera, et cetera, your readers will never get to your story. So they will not get a sample or they'll get just a short bit and uh, it will fail to sell your book. Granted, good blurbs from notable people can definitely give the book credibility. Uh, however, I would limit that uh, to maybe three to five blurbs at the front of the book or move them to the back of the book. I will now go over all of the pages that you can put into the front of your book. You will do these in particular for the print versions, so the paperback and hard cover versions. So first up are the blurbs. Now these can be put at the front of the book or the back of the book. So these are endorsements and reviews from credible authors, reviewers, critics, etc. The half title and title, you can insert a full image here as well. Be careful though, if you're doing this on your own without a software like Vellum or using a professional, you need to know what's on the verso and what pages are blank, etc. Okay. If you're using Vellum, it will do this automatically for you. Next up is the copyright page, which we'll spend a good deal of time on. That's a complicated page. Your dedication, your epigraph, and your table of contents. I can't recall if I mentioned this, but table of contents is required for your Kindle book. So uh, the copyright page, the title page, and the table of contents needs to be in the front of a Kindle book. Next set of pages is lengthier introductions written by other people or yourself. And this includes the forward, the introduction, the preface, and possibly the prologue. 
So blurbs is, as I've mentioned before, short endorsements or reviews of your book by credible people. So you list these out with the name. The next is title page, and that is required in all versions. That's going to be the title, the author's name, and the publisher's logo or publisher's name at the very least. Next comes the copyright page. The copyright page is probably the most um, complicated and legal page out of all of these. It has a lot of elements and it has a lot of history. Copyright itself is interesting in that you can use a poor man's copyright. Now, I'm covering U.S. law, uh, so that's what I know. Uh, if you're in another country, you're going to have your own copyright laws and your own copyright offices. I'm going to be talking about U.S. copyright here. In the U.S., as soon as you commit a work to a medium, so in this case, uh, software or to uh, the page. So as soon as you write it down, it is your property and is technically copyrighted. You can put just the word copyright with the copyright symbol, the year, and your name. And that is enough to formally declare that the work is copyrighted. However, if you want to go the legacy indie route, which we're covering in these videos, then you will want to register your copyright with the Copyright Office. You just go to the website copyright.gov, find register a literary work there, click it and follow the prompts. It will ask you for various information, but the title, author name, date of publication, etc. It'll lead you through the form uh, and it will ask you to upload a digital copy to the site for registration. There is a cost for this registration, and that's $65. You will receive a certificate with a copyright number, which is an alphanumeric code, in the mail. This is the only registration that costs money. Be aware that the LCCN, or the Library of Congress C Control number, does not cost anything. So if someone's charging you a package price for these registrations or charging you for the LCCN, then it is uh, sort of a scam or a service fee. You can go directly to the Library of Congress site to get your LCCN number for free. Library of Congress, uh, their website is a very complicated URL that I'm not going to be able to recite to you. So I'm going to put that in the description below and you can use that link. The reason why you'll want an LCCN is because this allows you to uh, have your books in libraries, which you know, why wouldn't you want your book in a library? It's a quick turnaround. You get the number within a couple of days. They do ask that once your book is published that you send a physical copy. And that is sort of a mysterious thing in itself. The Library of Congress, all of these millions of books somewhere uh, in this giant library, uh, <laughs> that in itself is sort of liminal and mysterious and sort of a fantasy in its, its own right. Also on the copyright page, you can put a disclaimer stating that uh, events or people in the book are a fiction. Put the publisher's information, how to contact them if somebody wanted to request to be able to cite the work or uh, just get in touch with you. Here, most authors also list their ISBNs. And this is just to make it easier for booksellers to track the book uh, so you're going to list your ebook, paperback, and hardcover ISBNs on the copyright page. Now, if you are looking at other copyright pages in books, you may see some cryptic looking strings of letters and numbers. And these tend to be printer's keys and they're just information that printers uh, use to convey information to each other or uh, convey the edition of the book. Next up is your dedication page. I would keep that simple. <laughs> you may be tempted to be a little sarcastic, maybe take a jab at somebody who wasn't supportive of you during the process of writing a first book. Uh, however, you know, 10 years down the line, you're going to want to um, just be genuine here. So thank whomever helped you along the journey, you know, and this is shorter acknowledgements 
uh, in the back of the book can list, you know, editors, designers, friends, first readers, teachers, etc. But for your dedication, you know, dedicate it to a loved one or someone who helped you become the writer that you are. Next page is the epigraph. And that is a typically a quote uh, from another author or uh, a mentor. Um, and this is something that it should, again, be authentic, chosen carefully. Uh, it is important that you get permission to quote any living author or poet or public figure. I can show you here the letter that I used to write to Edward Holmes to request his quote to appear in my epigraph. And uh, it is always wise to take those legal steps, get permission, always do your citations, and acknowledge works that you have incorporated into your book. Table of contents is pretty self-explanatory. It's to help people navigate the book. And uh, it, Amazon feels as though it is so important to be able to allow people to skip between chapters and parts, et cetera, that they do require it uh, for their eBooks. Um, for print books, you know, and in a novel, I don't know how important it is to be able to know where a chapter starts. I mean, it is a narrative, um, so you wouldn't want to skip around. Personally, I uh, just list out the parts and the key pages for the front and back matter in the table of contents. The next set of pages are lengthy and they are introductions to the book from various people. The foreword, spelled F O R E W O R D, often misspelled by authors, uh, is the before word and it is written by somebody else. You would ask somebody who is experienced in your area of fiction, if it's a nonfiction book, a authority in that area, uh, a mentor, a teacher, to write what they think about the book, why people should read the book, uh, their personal experience with the subject, etc. For many novels, it's probably unnecessary to request forwards unless, you know, you can get one from just a banger in your in your area in your genre. I mean, if you can get like Stephen King to write your foreword, well, yeah, yeah, get that done. Otherwise, it take takes up space before the reader gets into the story. They're going to want to jump right into your narrative. Likewise, the introduction and preface probably not necessary in a novel. So the preface would be uh, what inspired you to write the book, what experiences led up to the creation of the book why you wrote it, uh, those types of things. And the introduction would be further information, digging deeper into the subject matter or the themes within the book, um, more nonfiction information about what the story uh, contains. This might be included for historical fiction uh, if a lot of study went into um, the historical figure, etc. So you could include the introduction. I can see reasons for them. And please comment below if you have reasons for including forwards, prefaces, or introductions in your work. We do want to keep in mind that look inside feature again, where you're going to want to show uh, the story to get the reader engaged and started on the book so that they buy it. So those are the basic elements you're going to want to include at the front of your book. Again, in a couple of days, I'll film a video on the back matter, uh, which is equally as interesting and varied. Again, I really want you to keep in mind that this is the entry into your book, and you, with the reader experience in mind, can include all sorts of really cool, interesting things. You know, the dedication can be interesting and mysterious. The epigraph can be selected with care and really be thematic to the book. Yeah, you can hide little things within the front matter that enrich the experience and uh, intrigue the reader about you as an author and your story. So I hope I made something that you might have thought was a dull subject into an interesting one. 
Please let me know again if you would like to learn more about these particular elements of a book. If you'd like to claim your free indie publishing Trello project, this has every step from finished manuscript through editing, design, production, upload, and ongoing sales. Visit my website, kittyturner.media. So claim that. Also, make sure to like and subscribe this video, share it with author friends, build the community around the legacy indie author publishing experience. And thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.